Okay, so hi everybody and thanks to those of you who joined us for our webinar last week on um, the Help Our Help project. We were absolutely inundated with questions um, at the time of the webinar and also a whole load of questions that have come through since. So what we decided to do was record a video response so that we could go through all of the questions in quite an, a sort of informal chat um, way of doing things. Um, so um, hopefully if you watch the webinar, you'll know that I'm Sarah. I work at Sussex Wildlife Trust. I'm the Living Seas Officer. And of course, um, Ian's joining me here um, from the University of Portsmouth. So we've got quite a few straightforward questions that Ian's going to answer um, to do with kelp ecology. So do you want to have a look at those, Ian, and, um, and start us off? Thank you very much, Sarah. So hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to our Help Our Kelp project. Um, and, and as Sarah said, we're, we're doing this pre-recorded list of questions to further the conversation. So um, what I'm going to do is, is to start off with, with a few basic questions that have been asked. And then Sarah's going to ask some, uh, uh, answer some of her questions. Then we're going to kind of have a to and fro. So first question I have, is kelp edible? Essentially, yes, it is. Um, broadly speaking, seaweed, so um, brown, the brown algae, the red algae, and the green algae can be classified as sea vegetables. So they're full of fiber and of course they can be eaten. So very nutritious and full of iron in actual fact. Um, another question I've had is what is the difference between kelp and seaweed? Well, seaweed really is the broader term for all photosynthetic plants and algae in the marine environment. Okay, so if you think of the filamentous algae, the small algae that grow on sediments, but then the kelp are the big macro algae. Okay, so the big habitat and structural forming seaweed, such as the laminarias. Okay, so uh, these are the true kelp species, particularly in the UK that we touched upon last week. So as you know, we have seven of the 14 species of kelp in and around the UK that create this habitat complexity that drive the biodiversity in our coastal ecosystems. Another question that we've had is how many fronds are there on the stipes? Now, particularly if you will see um, uh, Laminaria hyperborea, now it will have these fronds, these finger-like fronds. Now, most importantly on those species, particularly you'll have about five fingers of fronds on each blade. Now, if you look at Laminaria digitata, it will have about double that. So anywhere between eight to 10 fronds, like finger-like fronds on each frond. And so those will be the photosynthetic parts or portion of the actual alga. Um, and then of course we have our third species, which is Saccharina latissima, and that has one big frond that's attached to the stipe then that's attached to the whole fast. So that way then you can uh, uh, identify between the different species. So Laminaria hyperborea, okay, otherwise known as tangleweed, will have about five fronds, uh, um, we'll have about five fingers on the frond, okay, so limited fingers. Um, then we have orweed, which is Laminaria digitata, will have quite a few fingers on each frond, okay, so that's Laminaria digitata, and then Saccharina latissima has one big broad frond. And then we have a question, do kelp exclude other seaweeds when they form a forest? Actually they do, absolutely, and this is not necessarily a bad thing because uh, when we have canopy gaps in the kelp forest what happens is the light will penetrate through and we get what we call the turf algae the small filamentous algae overgrowing on the substrata now of course the difference between the small algae that the filamentous algae growing on the substrata is that it isn't habitat forming okay so unlike the kelp which will generate what we call most importantly, the nursery function. So the spawning grounds for commercial fisheries, the kelp is very important in that. Whereas the small filamentous algae don't do that. So the big kelps will shade out the available sunlight. So it stops the small filamentous algae from overgrowing and essentially creating all intents and purposes, a phase, what we call a phase shift, where we go from a steady state ecosystem to an unstable state ecosystem. So I'm now going to hand over the mic back to Sarah to some of the questions that she has. Thank you. 
I'm just going to add a point in there as well, Ian, just going back to that very first question about is kelp edible, which obviously you said, yes, it is. But uh, we should probably caveat that with we wouldn't really recommend that you go and start harvesting kelp off the seashore here in Sussex because uh, probably not such a good idea. <laughs> Good point. Good point. I, I, and the reason, a very good point, Sarah, and actually, thank you for that. I didn't think of that, but Sarah <laughs> makes a very good point there because kelp actually does what we call bioremediation. OK, so it uptakes most of the nutrients and surrounding nutrients of the water, things like nitrates and phosphates. OK, so they're going to be highly packed with nutrients. And of course, they may uptake the surrounding heavy metals, etc., that are in the water as well. So it may not be a good idea for any washed up kelp to think, oh, I'm going to put that in the pot and have that with my roast dinner. So absolutely, please don't do that. Please don't do that. Which, and that actually brings me on to um, another question quite nicely, um, which is what about the smelly seaweed problem that used to happen in Worthing? Um, I've had that question come through a couple of times, actually, um, that I, I quite like the way that one was worded, the smelly seaweed problem. Um, I think somebody else. Oh, yes, the here it is. In the 1950s, um, seaweed used to wash up onto Worthing Beach, reaching depths of maybe 1.5 metres. Um, it would remain all summer, attract flies, and eventually sometimes tractors would clear it. Difficulty to get into the sea, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, it's a really good point. And to be honest, if we get to the point where seaweed kelp is washing up on the beach in such vast quantities, as far as the project goes, we will be saying success because the fact that there's enough kelp to actually wash up on the beach in the first place would be an absolute grand success as far as the restoration goes. But we do absolutely understand that that is not something that everybody, particularly residents of Worthing that want to use their beach, is going to appreciate and although it seems a long way off um we are sort of looking at various options as to what to do with that if if it does happen and um we've been working with Ada and Worthing councils as well and um, so they are um, involved in kind of you know the thought process on this and we've been thinking about various options for actually you know sort of upcycling it making use out of it doing something that's actually going to be helpful rather than just removing it and taking it away somewhere for it to rot in a landfill. So we're thinking about um, things like using it in fertilizer, that kind of thing. Um, I can't remember if there are any other uses, Ian. Was there anything else that we've been thinking about for, for using it? Um, fertilizer? I, I, th I, th I think you've covered it mainly because, I, I, as you say, I, I think it's going to be used for agriculture, for natural fertilizers. Um, again, upcycling it which I think is a great idea. Absolutely. Yeah, um, it's, and it's something we're going to be, you know, we've got time to think about what the various options are. And, you know, over the coming years, it may be that new new options for, for using these kind of materials in a useful manner may develop. So it's certainly something we're keeping an eye on. We don't want to be causing upset in Worthing or anywhere else, because um, I do appreciate that seaweed can be smelly when it washes up on the beach. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a good point well made and we are going to be um, considering that. And, and open for suggestions as well. If anybody's absolutely. got any ideas, absolutely open to suggestions. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, so do you want to go back and do another of the more ecological questions, Ian? You've got a couple of questions about kelp absolutely. more generally. Absolutely. So we've had several questions come in in actual fact, looking at sea urchins and the plight of kelp um, in Sussex and around, of course, the coast of the UK. Now, um, I should put a bit of, a little bit of context. I won't go too deep into it. Now, on, in, on the west coast of America, on our California coastline, lots of the kelp has been decimated. And this is because there's been what we call sea urchin barren. Big, big sea, swathes of sea urchins come along. And what they do is they graze the whole fast of the kelp. Now, the whole fast of the kelp, of course, as you now know, guys, is the anchor that anchors the kelp to the rocks. And the sea urchins come along, they graze the whole fast, the whole fast then detaches and the kelp will float away, losing the structure and the function of the ecosystem. Now, here in the UK, fortunately, we don't have the problem of grazing sea urchins. We don't have that. And that's not been there's no 
as far as I'm aware, there hasn't been any cases reported around the UK of sea urchins or sea urchin problems in the UK grazing on cow pulpus. But that's not the main problem that we see here. In the UK, our problems are related to either changing environmental conditions, which will be increasing temperature of water or increasing turbidity through dumping, dredging and, and uh, uh, extractive activities so coastal development. Um, trawling, for example, all these things will be the, the biggest dangers to kelp that we see in and around the UK, as opposed to these natural processes with uh, sea urchins, for example, predating on, on the hold fast. So um, we do see increasing sea temperatures and we do have uh, a warm water species actually um, called uh, Laminaria ochraluca, which actually is spreading further northwards okay and so it is a warm water species now in actual fact um uh, we are seeing it increasing uh, and i believe there's some populations of, of laminaria ochraluca in and around the isle of wight uh, we are seeing some populations of that so it is coming around this way now um it's kind of a, a, a climate change combatter if you will so it is deemed invasive but it's kind of succession to warming waters. Now, what we do see, though, with, with populations, and, and let's call them bands or zones of, of Laminaria ochraluca, is that um, we see a difference in biodiversity. So we do see that. So there will be a change in the diversity of organisms and the abundance of those organisms if the warm water species does take over. So there will be a difference there. Okay. Over to you, Sarah. Okay, I've been I was just scrolling through the questions there, and I was trying to see if there are any questions that kind of follow on from that, um, which I don't know that realistically the, the ones that I've sort of put down to, for me to answer do. Um, so I'm going to totally change the trajectory of what we're talking about and um, answer a controversial one, which is um, about the recent action by Greenpeace regarding dumping the large boulders off the Sussex coast, um, which was into the offshore marine conservation zone, offshore Brighton. Um, so I've had a couple of questions about this. Um, one of them was essentially just asking, um, was it a good thing that they did that? Uh, and another question asking whether Sussex Wildlife Trust collaborated with Greenpeace in conducting this action. So. No, <laughs> we, we definitely did not. Um, whether it was a good thing or not, it's, it's a really interesting question. It's a really interesting point of conversation. Um, speaking, you know, on behalf of the trust, um, you know, it's, it's quite a, you know, difficult question to answer. And there's lots of different opinions floating around on this. Um, but just to be clear on exactly what, what did happen, was that these boulders were dropped into an offshore marine conservation zone. Now that means it's sort of outside of the jurisdiction of the IFCA, which operate out to six nautical miles. And many of these offshore marine conservation zones all around the UK have been designated as marine conservation zones. They're protected. However, they have not got an awful lot of actual active protection in terms of bylaws or anything like that that actually prohibits any kind of activity in there. So as marine conservationists, considering these have been designated for a while now, some of them a good number of years, it is frustrating that we're still seeing trawling activity, licensable activities going on in these protected areas. Now, the government has committed to protecting our marine environment and like I say a number of these marine protected areas are still not safeguarded from these damaging activities. So what Greenpeace essentially did was drop these very large boulders sort of around the edge of the marine conservation zone to create a barrier to these large trawling fishing fisheries so that they just could not get their trawls in and you know, whilst at the Wildlife Trust, this is not the kind of action that we would take, um, you know, we, we don't engage in that kind of thing, but you can, you know, the kind of operation that Greenpeace does, you know, you can understand that how they decided that that was the only thing to do, you know, sending a message to the government 
um, sending a message saying, you know, this is enough is enough. We need these areas protected. And the only way we feel that we can do that is by creating a physical barrier and physically stopping the fishing from happening. Um, you know, it's, that, was, that was how they, they thought it, you know, was the, was the best way forward um, and deterring boats by putting these physical obstructions. So us as Sussex Wildlife Trust, we are absolutely committed to ensuring the conservation of our marine environment, um, including establishing active management, which is appropriate for these marine conservation zones. Um, and it's, it's an interesting because it happened, you know, at, at quite a pertinent time for us in terms of our bylaw, which is very much related to inshore. As I mentioned, it's where the Sussex IFCA operate. Um, so it is totally separate areas of the sea with regards to that. Um, like I said, I can't really say much more than that, to be completely honest. Um, but it is it's a very interesting point. And I'm looking forward to seeing whether um, the government do push anything forward in terms of protecting these offshore marine protected areas because it has been a long time. Um, so that's that's my answer. Do you think you'd like to add anything at all to that, Ian, or is this outside of your sort of normal area of expertise? It's uh, I, I do I do work with fishy and fishery policy, and, and you're you're exactly right. Uh, um, it, it's. The, Again, the, the, what what happened was nothing to do with with the Sussex Wildlife Trust, and uh, uh, it th those boulders were put way offshore to to stop trawling activity. And again, now what I will say is this: in actual fact, um, and for I'm coming from a, a conservation point of view, and I'm a, a marine ecologist and a marine conservationist, but I used to be a commercial fisherman. Okay, now. I'm saying this from a fishing fisherman point of view. Our objective is not to stop commercial fishing. Our objective is to stop destructive activity. There's a difference. OK, now um, the difference being in that we can work with nature and be low impact with our footprint and still maintain a future career and still maintain biodiversity and a commercial fishery. We know this through Lime Bay and the Lime Bay fishery. This is because the commercial fishermen will fish with low impact methods. That's to say they don't have any trawling or dredging activities. So they use lobster pots and static fishing nets. And so what that does, that minimizes the impact to the seabed. So that allows what we call the benthic habitat. So the seabed sessile creatures to grow back. And essentially for Sussex, our benthic sessile creatures, our organisms will be the kelp. So that will allow the kelp to grow back. Because if you think about it, if you're trawling or dragging a net, you're essentially mowing the lawn, aren't you? You're cutting the kelp down. Although with pots, there will be minimal damage, but nowhere near as extensive as it would if you were trawling. OK, so we're not saying we don't want commercial fishing. We're, we're, we want to work with fishermen and we want to have low impact fishing methods occurring so that we can generate an increased biodiversity. So a few numbers in Lime Bay. The fishermen 15 years ago stopped trawling and stopped dredging and only went to using lobster pots. Now, 10 years later, they're catching two and a half times more fish with 20 to 50 percent less effort. And there's four and a half times the abundance of biomass of the fish within the fishery. So in actual fact, it's very sustainable in its actions and how it's run. And the fishermen run it themselves with a voluntary code of conduct. And we want to roll this out around the UK, engaging the fishermen and bring the fishermen on board. That's a really good point, well made Ian. And I think a lot of people sort of think that marine conservation and fishing can't ever work together. But, you know, Lime, Lime Bay is, is living proof that it can. And yeah, like you said, this is kind of what we hope to achieve here. OK, so after that somewhat mentally exhausting answer, I think, to uh, <laughs> the, um, the Greenpeace action, should we go back and, and have a think more about um, ecology, 
I know you've got some more ecology questions. So again, what I'm doing, guys, is just reading off the list and then kind of deleting them as I tick them off. So the next one on my list is what are the benefits to the wider community of animals, particularly wading seabirds? Now, of course, there's a huge amount of benefits, OK, because kelp is what we call an ecosystem engineer. So what does that mean? Essentially, it draws down greenhouse gases, so it mitigates climate change, it provides habitat and it provides structure to the ecosystem. But principally, it increases what we call food webs. So these are the primary producers all the way going up to apex predators with primary uh, uh, predators hunting the fish okay, and other invertebrates. So you have a range of organisms through a food web. OK, so this is what we call trophic levels of energy going through the food web. Now, what you'll see within the canopy, there'll be lots of different grazers and isopods upon the fronds and, and basically essentially the leaves of the kelp. And you'll get wading birds coming in, feeding off of those prey items and those invertebrates on the fronds of the kelp. So this is only going to benefit the wider biodiversity by increasing the energy flow within the ecosystem and between the ecosystems. Oh, and just looking at my questions here, um, which I, I guess this actually relates quite a bit to the, the last question, but also because of the fact that you've been talking about supporting a wider ecosystem. Um, we've got a question here, which is, wouldn't it be best not to eat seafood and therefore not support the largely destructive fishing industry? So, Again, going thinking about what we talked about before about conservation and fisheries, you know, going actually going hand in hand, but also about what Ian's just been saying about supporting a wider ecosystem and the whole food web. So a lot of, well, not a lot, but you know, a, a portion of that food web is going to be commercially fished species, be that you know, fish or shellfish, whatever. So, yes, it's an interesting point. And I think if anybody's watched that Sea Spiracy program, which I, I did over the weekend, it's a, a really interesting point that they raise. And I, I had some thoughts on it. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail now because we've only got a short time. But yeah, it is, I, we do want to support fishing, and but non-destructive fishing. Um, Ian, I can see you're bursting to, yeah, <laughs> to I, say. I've I got an answer for that. I do have okay. an answer for that. Now, OK. To answer that, why don't we just stop eating seafood? Um, well, the, the thing is, livelihoods is a social economic issue. OK, now. Millions, when I say millions, we're talking. 500, 600, 700, 100, you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of people dependent upon protein source from the oceans. OK, now the science. We're going, I'm, of course, I'm, we're all science based here. Now, the science tells us if you don't work with the stakeholders, if you don't have the stakeholders on side, you will not have a marine protected area and it will not work. OK, so in other words, the fishermen will still do what they're doing. So you have to work with them. OK, so it's about give and take. So the reason why I mentioned about the Lion Bay model, because it's sustainable and it's low impact. So in other words, it's a win for the ecology, a win for the environment and a win for the stakeholders and community that are dependent upon them. Because, as I said, socioeconomics. OK, so the people that have been thriving and depending on those ecosystems still need to do that. And so it's not for us to say, stop doing what you're doing because you can't do that because they're dependent upon those ecosystems. But it is for us. The onus is on us to actually explain how to do it more sustainably with low impact methods. So we do have that responsibility, okay? So it's about working together and formulating a plan that everybody is satisfied and happy with. And so it's about working in unison to have these actively managed, let's call them marine parks, to go forward and be successful. OK, so we, we all want thriving oceans. We all want to mitigate climate change and we all want biomass of different biodiversity of fish species. So it's rich and vibrant, breathing new life into our coastal ecosystems. We can do that if we all work together. Absolutely. 
I think as well, like one of the things that we want to achieve through this project is um, being able to, like you say, work with the fishing industry, but then supporting that fishing industry to be sustainable so that local people can enjoy it and there can be clarity and um, you know traceability for local people to understand where their fish or seafood is coming from and that is what I would suggest you know is a much better way of, of sort of thinking about seafood rather than just blanket saying no you shouldn't eat it um, understand where it's come from and, and understand whether that source is truly sustainable or not completely agree sir 100 percent which you just reminded me in actual fact um in in lime bay we have what we call reserve seafood now it is an outlet only for sustainably caught fish species whether it's lobster or net caught fish okay now the benefits of reserve seafood is that it has to have the seal of approval of fish that were caught with low impact methods now, what we're trying to do within the Lime Bay model is then generate bespoke, bespoke sustainability ratings for that, okay, because it's sustainably caught. Now, the benefits of fishing within a sustainable, sustainably fished uh, fish brand called Reserve Seafood is that the fishermen in Lime Bay have the shoreline chiller units where they can maximize the premium quality of their fish. We provide ice machines. They have lobster storage facilities. So they have a whole range of facilities to maximize the quality of their product, which then brings premium price for their, core, for their sustainably caught items and fish. So when they're harvesting the oceans, it's low impact. And so you get a seal of approval from, from the ocean to the person buying the actual fish or, or lobster. So it tells a story, as you say, Sarah, absolutely. Exactly. Oh, I seem to be ha having all of the more intense questions. So. <laughs> absolutely, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You want to go back and have a have another look at some of the uh, okay. ecological and recovery questions? So let, let me go through some of these. Again, I'm just reading off the top of the list here, guys. Does kelp detritus, which sinks to the sea floor, provide habitat for other creatures? Okay. So absolutely, yes. Yeah. So you'll see lots of grazing, lots of grazing organisms like top shells, which are these uh, small little gastropods, which will uh, um, graze upon the algae. And again, that's then providing a greater food chain through the wider community of animals with that flow of carbon, kelp derived carbon flowing through the ecosystem. So you'll get lots of detritivores processing that carbon then you'll get smaller fish eating those detritivores, then bigger predatory fish eating those smaller fish, etc. So that energy flows through the food chain. Okay, so you'll get a whole multitude of organisms depending upon that kelp derived carbon. And in actual fact, there's roughly about 45% of the productivity of our coastal oceans. Okay, whether that's uh, grazing organisms, whether it's crabs or other fish dependent upon kelp derived carbon or organic material so it's vitally important also we have another question saying will we also protect and or allow recovery of seagrasses absolutely um, in actual fact i'm working in collaboration with the environment agency along the sussex coastline um, for for reducing impacts to what we call essential fish habitat under that umbrella that broad umbrella obviously a kelp as you know for the nursery function but also salt marsh and seagrass okay all three together will maximize carbon drawdown from the atmosphere so you're mitigating climate change exponentially by those three ecosystems but also each of those three ecosystems have key nursery functions and carbon storage uh, capabilities and mitigate coastal erosion, for example. So yes, the answer in short, we will be um, uh, increasing protection against seagrasses, salt marsh and kelp. Um, also, um, how much hard substrata lies off the Sussex coast? Now, in actual fact, lots of the Sussex coastline 
is, is hugely appropriate for kelp restoration. But what I will say is this, guys, we have at the minute what we call this veneer, okay? So overlying the top of the hard substrata of the rock and chalk baseline. Now that veneer will be gravel and pebbles. This is because over the years of the dredging in particular, the coastal development and the destructive activity has then enabled the finer, should we say, broken up sediment to then overlay on top of the rocky substrata. So it will be a matter of time before the tidal flow gets rid of that veneer to enable to uh, uh, establish the more rockier areas. And we're seeing areas, what we call readily restorable areas with kelp, where kelp is thriving. But what we need to do is provide habitat, extra habitat, which then goes on to the active or passive restoration processes that we'll be doing, which I'll go into later on in some of my questions. Um, and I'm going to answer one more question before I hand back to Sarah is why do we want carbon moved to the deep water? Really good question. Now, we have carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, which is a greenhouse gas. OK, so that's warming the oceans. OK increasing impacts from climate change, melting the polar ice caps, water levels are increasing, okay? And so we're seeing regime shifts, we're seeing phase shifts, we're seeing species distributions change through a changing climate. Now, the reason why we want to lock away those greenhouse gases is because kelp will act as a really magnificent sponge, absorbing that CO2 from the atmosphere, drawing it down and locking away. Now, once that carbon processed in an inorganic form, so dissolved organic material, okay, or dissolved organic matter, kelp derived dissolved organic matter, once it floats away to the deep ocean trenches or deeper water, it gets locked away, away from the atmosphere, reducing CO2 emissions or greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So it locks it away into the oceans rather than creating or facilitating climate change. Over to you, Sarah. Great. Um, just looking at the questions, I'm glad you I'm glad you ran through a load of yours there because you've got quite a quite a significant number more to get through still that are related to your sort of area. But um just looking at a few that we've had um, I'm gonna sort of lump a few of these together because um we've had quite a few questions about stakeholders and is x organization involved so um we've got a question about councils so um we mentioned earlier and obviously it was in our talk last week that um the Ada and Worthing councils are directly involved they sit on our strategic stakeholder group um is Aaron not part of things and also Brighton and Hove. Um, so in terms of councils, we are engaging them all. We're trying to um, ensure that they all have a seat upon the table for our strategic stakeholder group. Um, Aaron did not initially, um, they weren't able to join us for that strategic stakeholder meeting, but have actually recently um, engaged with us really directly and are really keen now to to be involved um, in whatever capacity you know that that means going forward we still don't really know exactly what um involvement from councils is actually going to be like it's just them buying into our idea our project at the moment um but absolutely aaron are now engaging which is fantastic um someone asked about brighton and hove council um, which is an interesting one and, and kind of brings up um another question which is um about people asking uh, why the project is only kind of extending out to Shoreham. So if you remember the map of our project area, we essentially sort of go from Selsey to, to about Shoreham, which is where the historical um, kelp beds were. So I know there has been some people sort of querying about where the kelp was, was further over from that, but this is our project area for now. We may well extend over, but we're we're trying not to bite too much, bite off too much more than we can chew. I think is is fair to say, isn't it, Ian? Um, but in terms of Brighton and Hove Council, we haven't been sort of liaising with them, you know, directly, um, because of the fact that they sit outside of the geographical area that we're currently working in. But we are engaging, you know, the the wider area as well, and we're not trying to leave anyone out of discussions. So absolutely, Brighton and Hove 
will be sort of involved in wider discussions. But as for what's happened so far, it, it wasn't really kind of, um, they weren't really an organisation that, that needed to be involved in those sort of initial discussions. Um, we've also had a question about whether um, Shaw and Port um, is involved in being a stakeholder. Yes, yes, they are. Um, they have um, had meetings with us um, about what their role can be in terms of, um, again, strategic going, taking things forward. And um, I also understand they're working um, with the now Sussex Dolphin Project um, and some sort of research to do with kelp with, with them as well. So quite a lot going on with Shore and Port. And as I say, this is all just kind of conversations meetings that have happened in a you know sort of somewhat casual capacity you know no one signed up to any any massive you know agreements or anything but it's just people that are involved in the conversation and keen to drive things forward um, and then finally a conversation um sorry question about the angling trust have they been involved in the project as yet no they haven't um but now that the bylaw is in place and that we're driving things forward um, we are really, really keen to engage any stakeholders such as the Angling Trust. So I'm absolutely sure they're going to be on our hit list of people that we're going to be contacting um, to, to see if we can you know, engage with them going forward and, and what they want to sort of bring to the table or um, any things that they think can be driven forward through the project, that kind of thing. So um, Angling Trust definitely will be um, involved if we can uh, get them get them in contact. And I'm sure there are plenty of other organisations that you know, similar kind of stakeholder input. We're really, yeah, looking forward to engaging all kinds of stakeholders. Um, so I think that's it for stakeholders. Um, back to you then, Ian. Fantastic. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so a, a lot of it's repeated. I've already answered some of the questions inadvertently in, in earlier questions. Um, the top of my list, um, if kelp are a cold water species, will the kelp actually be able to recover if the temperature of the water increases? Well, as you now know, we do have a warm water species of kelp. So Laminaria ochraluca coming into the UK. So we will expect over time, eventually, Laminaria ochraluca to come into play in Sussex. But at the minute, I, I very much doubt that's going to happen. What I expect, because we do see still quite large areas of Laminaria digitata, Laminaria... Uh, um, um, Hyperborea and Saccharina latissima. So we do see those species. So what we're expecting is a succession of those species first coming into play. Then maybe over time we may see Laminaria ochraluca coming in, but I don't expect that to happen. So in actual fact, I do see it as a business as usual scenario um, coming into play with this kelp restoration project. And also I've been asked what sort of methods we will be using. Um, um, such as seeded ropes or any other methods. Now, in actual fact, I remember during the talk, I kind of used seeded ropes as an example. And I know there's other countries that are using seeded, seeded ropes as an example of restoration, particularly on uh, the east coast of Canada, they do that methodology. However, we're going to be using active and passive restoration techniques. So that's going to involve not using seeded ropes in actual fact, but it's going to actually using seeded stones called green gravel. OK, so that's going to be the active part of the restoration where we're, we're actually going to give Mother Nature a hand to restore the baby kelps or the density of the baby kelps in the water to settle on larger rocks. So we're going to be using the green gravel technique to start off with, but we're going to be doing lots of trial studies what we call mesocosm studies in the area in in different areas of turbidity to see how those baby kelps will settle particularly with different species and what i'm expecting my best bet for example is saccharina latissima to grow because it's very opportunistic in murkier waters because it has a broader frond and able to photosynthesize in darker waters for example and you'll see it in more murkier waters so that's what we're going to be doing in terms of the restoration processes and the, the natural processes, I should say, guys, is basically as what it says on the tin in that uh, areas where we see large stands of kelps growing already and already established. That's going to provide what we call a good seed bank of sporophytes or baby kelps 
to then flourish in the water in the prevailing tide to settle on the available substrata and grow. And that's then going to piggyback in different distances from those standing uh, kelp stands that we already have. Um, we always have a question here, which actually has stumped me. Um, is anyone looking at impacts of microplastics in kelp? Um, now, in short, I don't know. I think that's a really good question. Um, and that's something I actually I'm going to investigate tomorrow on my day off on Good Friday. So I'm going to be looking into that and, and, and exploring what research has been done on, micro, on microplastic in kelp tissues and the impact of kelp. And I imagine, I wonder if that's going to impede the ability of kelp to photosynthesize or uptake extra nutrients. But I wonder what the impact of this. I think that's a really good question. So in short, I don't know. So that, that, that question has stumped me. So very good question there. Maybe, Ian, this is this is a new stream of research for us to undertake as part of the, the Help Our Kelp research Absolutely. going forward. Absolutely. I think it's something that needs to be looked into. And we can look into that by all means. And we, we can actually answer those questions in our own research, in fact. So I think we will incorporate that in some of our master's projects and have a look at that. I think it's a valid question because kelp will bioremediate lots of the nutrients in surrounding water. So one would assume that it will uptake microplastics as well. So I very much, I very much expect it will. But what the impact of that is to the kelp, I do not know. So we can test that. Good question. Um, and what's really interesting is that even if um, Ian finds a whole load of research that has already been done on microplastics in, in kelp, which I suspect probably hasn't been done, but even if it had, it would still make a very interesting study because of the fact that, you know, it wouldn't have been done in this area and that's I think what's really interesting about this project generally is that although there has been kelp restoration and people know a lot about kelp and um, the carbon cycling aspect is that we don't know what that will mean when we bring it to Sussex so that's what a lot of our research is going to be focused on and I just wanted to add as well and um, to, to Ian's answer there about the research that we're going to be doing because just in the interest of a bit of clarity and, and giving a bit more info about what we're actually up to, we've, we've got a whole load of um, streams of research which are being developed and pushed forward, and um, particularly now that the bylaw has gone through and um, all of the different things that Ian's been talking about there in terms of, um, you know, seeding and, and that is sort of being incorporated into these different streams of research. You know, we've got some PhDs that are some of which are, you know, fully funded now, some of which we're, we're still trying to get through. So um, we are doing a lot of very active research um, as part of, of Help Our Kelp and it's all, you know, sort of coming back into the project so that we can understand better that exactly what's going on and, and other things that might be at play here. So um, we are we are very much doing, you know, active research to understand things as well as actually trying to just get the policy in place and, and drive restoration. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so, I've, I've got, I have three more questions left. OK, I'm just thinking about we've we've been talking for nearly 45 minutes here, so we probably want to speed things up just a little bit. Um, do you want to talk about this? You've got a question here about similar projects um, and then we've got a few questions related specifically I'll, to I'll, our I'll project. I'll quickly answer my, my last three questions. I can do those very quickly. Similar projects. Um, I've already mentioned east coast of Canada, there's a restoration project, but using seeded ropes. So it's a different methodology to what we're using. And they're using actually uh, um, uh, uh, heat tolerant or thermo tolerant kelps in those areas because uh, uh, climate change has affected the kelp forest in on the east coast of Canada and on Chile, the coast of Chile, they're using green gravel to some level of success in actual fact. Um, but obviously we can't look to Chile because the ecosystems there are completely different to here. But they do use green gravel restoration techniques on the coast of Chile. Um, and then the other question I've got, what data do you collect to work out current or future biomass and status of the kelp? This is fantastic. And we're actually, this is one of our PhDs that Sarah touched upon that with myself at Portsmouth and with uh, the Brighton University, Ray, Ray Ward, we're working on a PhD looking at kelp derived carbon. Now, what we're doing is looking at the ratio of carbon and nitrogen within the kelp, okay, called stable isotopes. Now, that will have a signature, a chemical signature 
But when the kelp carbon floats away and ends up in different parts of the ocean, we can then trace that kelp and quantify its volume using stable isotope analyses. So that's what we're going to be doing. So not only will we be looking at the standing stock of kelp, okay, so looking at the carbon content, we're also looking at what we call the productivity, the growth rates. So you can mark using, say, a hole punch, okay, or creating a hole in the fronds and measuring the growth rate of the kelp and measuring that biomass over time. But then you can look for the chemical signature of the nitrogen and carbon in the deep ocean waters, quantifying the carbon sink that's offshore away from kelp, because kelp acts as a carbon conveyor, drawing down carbon from the atmosphere into the kelp tissues, transporting it to deeper waters and to some of it in shallower waters. And we can trace that using stable isotope ratios. Finally, my last question, um, Ian, who do you recommend for looking at to further literature? Well, in my book, there's only one person, that's Dan Smiley. OK, so if you're going to look at any literature around, he is fantastic, very knowledgeable. Go and look up any literature right around Kelp by Dan Smiley. I yeah. thought for a second, Ian, you were going to just refer to yourself. No, no, I, 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 I bow to Dan. He, he's a, a world leading expert in Kelp and very knowledgeable. So he's a fantastic and, and works out of Plymouth. So, um, so yeah, so the MBA, so Marine Biological Association. So go, go and refer to Dan's literature, fantastic. Cool, so we just have a, a few more questions just relating um, to the project. Um, one of which is quite interesting and, and does sort of follow on a little bit from, from what you were just talking about there, Ian, which is, um, do you take volunteers for the project? So um, yes, we will be taking volunteers um, in a sense in that um, we are going to be running sea search dives, which are gonna be specifically supporting the PhD projects um, and just the wider research that is ongoing throughout the, the Help Hub Help project. And um, so for sea search, you do need to be a qualified scuba diver. Um, you do need to undertake um, our training course, which happens to be running um, later in this month. So do, if you are interested, do get in touch. Um, I run Sea Search for Sussex and um, we're always very willing to take new volunteers. And um, we also do hope that we'll be able to support um, probably in a slightly lesser capacity, but just more generally through our Shore Search programme, which is intertidal surveys. Um, so um, I'm sure we've mentioned at some point um, throughout the talks that we that kelp can be found on the intertidal um, on a very low tide. So we do sometimes find it when we're doing our shore search surveys. So we will also be supporting through that kind of indirectly. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in getting involved, then do, do get in touch um, because we are always keen for, for new volunteers, particularly for sea search. Um, and then we've had a question about fundraising and someone wanted to know if they can fundraise up their school. Um, this is something I just checked with um, our fundraising team. And it is, I think, something that we're going to be looking into um, in terms of actually setting something up so that you can fundraise directly for the, the kelp as opposed to just Sussex Wildlife Trust more generally. So if your school is interested, um, what I would recommend is that you get in touch with Sussex Wildlife Trust directly. We can, um, if you just go through our inquiries email address, we can then direct it appropriately and we can let you know when we've got something set up so that anyone that wants to do that can. And we absolutely appreciate your support. That's really, really lovely. Um, so just before we, we finish up, um, we've had a few questions which relate to um, the policy side of things. Um, there's one question here about uh, the wind farm, which I'm going to um, just briefly touch on here. So um, will the proposed extension to Rampion um, impact the kelp and the restoration project in any way. Um, I've had that question a couple of times actually. Um, so interesting question. Um, the proposed extension is not yet finalised. Um, so what they've got is an area of search. And of course, it does then need to be co connected onto the land. So the original cable um, that connects the wind farm as it stands is, doesn't have the capacity to support the electricity that will be being generated by the extension. So it needs another cable. So the wind farm itself is quite a long way offshore, far further out than we would realistically see kelp growing. Even though kelp can grow you know, quite deep 
in Sussex. I think I'm pretty sure I'm correct on this, Ian, that it wouldn't really be growing that deeply because of the fact that it's too murky. There's not enough light penetrating. Good. Giving me the, the OK symbol there. So I'm, I'm not talking total nonsense. But where, where we might see impact is where the cable route comes through. Um, it will, the, the area of search they're looking at is to make landfall at Climping, which is just west of um, Littlehampton. So yes, there is potential that it might impact some of the habitat. Um, at Sussex Wildlife Trust, we are working sort of on this consultation as it happens, um, as, the, um, as they're looking at all of their different options. So um, I'm actually set on the Rampians um, expert topic groups for the marine um, conservation issues. So obviously there are public consultations going on, which people um, I know have been supporting and have actually been mentioning the kelp um, in the recent informal consultation, which is really lovely. Um, but what we're actually doing is kind of working with them um, on a more fundamental level to, to try and make sure what they're doing is as least impactful to wildlife and the important habitat that it supports. Um, so I can't really give you a, def a definitive definitive answer right now as to whether or not it's going to have an impact. What I can say is that we are working to try and minimise the impacts that the um, construction of the new wind farm is going to have. Um, and then lastly, there were a number of questions which I'm afraid we have totally ignored um, for the purposes of this video regarding trawling and the new bylaw. Um, unfortunately, we, we did invite Sean Ashworth, who's the Deputy Chief Officer at the Sussex Inshore and Fisheries Conservation Authority, to join us on this call, but unfortunately he wasn't able to make it. Um, so rather than trying to answer all of those questions on his behalf, um, I wanted to give him you know, the floor to, to actually answer them properly from, you know, so that you can hear it from the horse's mouth rather than us trying to sort of give you a, a, a less than brilliant answer um, to a lot of those questions. Um, so I'm going to make sure that he has copies of those questions and whether or not he does um, some kind of follow up video in this sort of format or if he posts perhaps a, a blog or gets back to people individually, we will make sure that um, those questions get answered because there were some really interesting and important points raised. And I would really like to make sure that they all get answered. But like I said, it would be so much better coming directly from the people that have created and are enforcing the bylaw in coming through from us. Um, so that is essentially all of the questions and we've been talking for nearly an hour. So if you are still watching at this point, bravo. Thank you very much for listening to us. Um, and yes, thank you for supporting Help Our Kelp and following us along on, on what is quite a long journey and we're only at the beginning of it. Um, we do hope to create more content like this in the future. So please do keep keep in touch, keep sending us questions if you want to, and um, keep following us along on this journey. Thank you very much, everyone. Much appreciated. Thank you for your time.